Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to PHS Live. Um, it's five o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and begin uh, this uh, day's session. Um, I am Fred Tangeman, the Director of Communications at the Presbyterian Historical Society. Um, today, we're going to be talking with Robert D. Stoddard, Jr., the author of Sarah and Her Sisters, American Missionary Pioneers in Arab Female Education, 1834 to 1937. Robert D. Stoddard is a former vice president of Lebanese American University in Beirut, Lebanon. He has a BA in religion from the College of Worcester and an MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary. Bob is a very experienced researcher at PHS and a friend of PHS and somebody who has a lot to say about the importance of archives in the work of history. And that's one of the things we're gonna to be touching on later in the session. Um, before we go ahead and hear from Bob, I wanted to just give a quick little overview to some of the programming notes for today. Um, my PHS colleague, Kristen Gatos, is moderating the chat. Uh, links to purchasing information for Bob's book are going to go ahead and be placed into that chat, um, as well as information about the collections at PHS that relate to um, his book and the, the research that he's done. So if you have any questions related to the session, please go ahead and click the Q&A button. Um, and that's a good way to, to let Krista know that you have a question to ask. Um, we will begin asking questions for the session um, about 15, in about, uh, I would say around 5.30 or so. Um, so it's never too early to go ahead and get those questions in. And if you have um, other things that you want to ask or, or just raise, you can go ahead and type those questions or comments into the chat, um, which you can go ahead and access at the bottom of your screen if you're, if you're joining us on Zoom. If you are watching on Facebook, uh, you can also ask questions. And our colleague, Allison Davis, is monitoring Facebook for us today. So um, thank you in advance to Kristen and to Allison. So uh, let's go ahead and um, say one last thing, which is that we are gonna be uh, recording today's session. So if you miss any part of it, you're gonna be able to watch it after we post the video on the PHS website. So without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome uh, to PHS Live, Bob. So hi, Bob. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks so much for being with us today. How are things in the first state? Uh, things are um, a little gray, but um, there's a hint of spring in the area. A hint. That's 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 something we can hold on to. We need that right now. So you gotta hope. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Bob, um, thank you so much again for joining us today. I think one of the things we wanted to start off with was um, give you an opportunity to read a little bit from the opening of your book, so that our audience can get a, a flavor of. Um, your wonderful uh, history, but also um, start off at, at, towards the beginning of it. And then we can sort of ask some questions coming out of that reading. Sounds good. January 28, 1834. Beirut, Syria. A heavily loaded skiff ground to a halt in the shallow waters of Beirut Harbor. Its sole occupant, dressed in a long blue dress and matching bonnet, was immediately swept up and carried ashore in the arms of a burly, dusky-skinned porter, clad only in pantaloons rolled above his knees. Gently lowered to the white sand beach, 32-year-old Sarah Huntington Smith could hardly believe that her high-heeled ankle boots were, after a four-month voyage from Boston, at last touching Syria's sacred shore. Nor could she ever imagine how, in her brief time in this Bible land, her work would forevermore change the lives of the benighted females of Syria let alone light a flame for female education that would spread throughout the Arabic-speaking world within a century. Sarah and her husband of five months, the Reverend Eli Smith, 
were warmly welcomed by the Reverend Isaac Byrd and his wife, Anne. Fellow New Englanders who were the longest serving American missionaries in Ottoman Syria. As porters arguing loudly in Arabic loaded the Smith's baggage and trunks onto patiently waiting donkeys, Sarah was helped onto one of the small beasts. Riding side saddle, she and Mrs. Bird began the trek uphill to the mission house on the north side of the Cape of Beirut, with their husbands walking ahead and their baggage following. Upon reaching the three-story mission house called Burj Bird, Bird's Castle in Arabic, the newcomers were introduced to eight other missionary couples, brothers and sisters in Christ, also sent by the American Board of Foreign Missions to the Holy Land to bring the Protestant gospel to native Eastern Catholic and Orthodox Christians viewed as lapsed in the faith, as well as to Arab Muslims and Jews. Eli and Sarah moved into their own room in the mission house. Her first letter home described her bird's eye view of the small walled city laying at the foot of the beautiful and famed Mount Lebanon. Gardens toward the south with hedgerows of cactus or prickly pear, mulberry trees, sycamore, carob, palm, and cypress, and almond trees in full blossom, beauties beyond description. She was fascinated by the bright yellow houses tinged with brown scattered among the gardens. Mount Lebanon in all its grandeur stretches from north to south while the snowy ridges of its lofty eminences and the numerous villages in its declivities give additional interest to the ever varying scenery. I will never tire of the scene spread before me. Beirut pleases me more than any place I have ever seen, including my own dear native Norwich. On outings, accompanied by Eli or their servant Ahmed, Sarah felt herself surrounded by degraded and benighted Syrian women. To her, they were like innocent children whom she yearned to enlighten. As girls, they spent most of their time at home, helping their mothers, keep house, cook, serve meals, take care of younger siblings, and wait on male relatives. Girls had nothing to look forward to other than being married off to a husband who would expect the same from her as a wife. Joining his wife on the mission house terrace one morning, Eli offered a sympathetic ear. So along to improve the situation of her Syrian sisters, upon whom not a ray of comfort would ever beam through the endless duration of their existence. The couple felt that somehow their own very existence would be identified with them. Realizing that it would require all her diligence, Sarah then and there resolved that her work should hereafter be identified with them. She hoped to live a long, good old age among this people, working to improve the lives and save the souls of Arab girls and women, Eli saw a wide door of usefulness opening before her from which no other engagements would interfere or divert her energies. Thank you, Bob, for that reading. 
Um, so let's go ahead and start with some questions um, so that people can get a little bit more of a sense about um, the focus of your history. First off, importantly, um, let's talk a little bit about Sarah Huntington Smith. Um, in particular, um, how was it that you came to choose her as the central figure in your history about groundbreaking women educators in Ottoman Syria and Lebanon? Well, when I uh, started back as the vice president at uh, Lebanese American University in Beirut in 1999, one of the first assignments I had was to organize a celebration of the 75th anniversary of the university as a college. And I looked around, I was the only Presbyterian on staff, so I looked around to, to find that some historic information that I could use in the celebration. And lo and behold, there was precious little of it available. Uh, so it was kind of a weak celebration. But when I retired, I decided I'd see if I could track down some information about this, um, this uh, tradition that the school grew out of the first school for girls uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, there was a, a marker downtown next to the evangelical church that said that was the site of the school. And it was founded by a Mrs. Sarah Smith. Uh, so I, I, I Googled her online and lo and behold, her memoir popped up and there was the story. So it verified that. And I got very excited about that. And I, I, I read it through several times, I actually outlined it. And I wrote to uh, Dr. J uh, Joseph Traber, the president of the university, I said, I've found this story and I'd love to come back to the university and give a lecture on it. And he said, fine, come ahead. So I went back and I gave three lectures, two on Sarah and one on Eli. And at the, the, the last dinner in Beirut, the uh, vice president for academic affairs looked at me across the table and he said, all right, you've given us the story of Sarah, now connect the dots between Sarah in today's university. Well, that was a challenge I couldn't ignore. And so I went to work and I, I came across some other uh, missionary memoirs, uh, some from mis missionaries like, uh, like um, Isaac and, uh, and Bird, and that preceded Sarah, and another, uh, others that, uh, for missionaries that were, who were after Sarah. And the most helpful one was a missionary by a missionary memoir by the Reverend Henry Jessup, uh, 55 years in Syria, which really outlined the history of the mission from the mid 19th century on to, to, to uh, 1910 when he died. So that was a really helpful outline. And then I went to the Presbyterian Historical Society and started to find primary resource materials that were actually written by this series of missionaries, all of whom were, were really good and sometimes great writers. So when I discovered all this material, I really had a sense of calling. I've got to, I've got to tell these stories again. I've got to bring them to light and share that with the, the, the LAU community and especially the women, the, the, the co-eds, the, the female teachers and staff, and the alumna, uh, to, they need to know these stories of these courageous women to whom they are indebted now uh, for their own access to education and quality education. And th then I discovered that it was really kind of a fun experience and it was a great learning experience. And, and of course, my wife, Judy, was thrilled that I had this uh, retirement project that kept me occupied and out of her hair. So that's, that's how I came to be writing about these women. Excellent. Um, I think we just saw that um, one of our colleagues has pasted into uh, the chat uh, a link to, um, to a resource that you could you know, explore later on if you're watching the session now or if you're watching it later. Um, so Bob, thanks. You, you taught you in your reading that you did, you uh, you bring us in to the scene of Sarah Smith arriving in Beirut. And you, you mentioned how she looks out over the city and how later this would be as a, a, the fondest sort of place for her in the world 
even more fun, I think, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, than Norwich, where she comes from in Connecticut. So could you tell us a little bit about where Sarah and, and other women educators who came over to the Mideast came from? What world were they coming from before they arrived um, in Beirut, in Lebanon, sure. And Syria? Sure. Well, Sarah, Sarah was born into a very privileged, pietistic congregational family in Norwich, Connecticut. And they traced their roots back to the Puritans. Uh, her grandfather was a general in uh, Washington's army. Uh, her, uh, a, 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 either an uncle or cousin was John Trumbull, who uh, painted those marvelous murals uh, of the Declaration of Independence that are hanging in the Capitol Rotunda in Washington. You saw them uh, displayed prominently on April, on uh, January 6th, unfortunately. But that was her uh, relative. Uh, her father, her father uh, well, came from some wealth. He was a banker and a merchant, very prominent churchman. Uh, she was a middle child. Uh, she had an older brother and sister and two younger brothers. She went to a primary grammar school, probably founded by, set up by her father. She went a year for a private, in a private girls' school and a year in finishing school as a teenager. Um, she was an adventuresome girl, hiker. She liked to travel. And uh, but she had a traumatic religious conversion at the age of 18 that really led her to uh, become a missionary. As, as for some of the others in the book, uh, there's uh, Matilda Whiting of Newark, New Jersey, who founded the uh, girls' school in Jerusalem. Um, I wish I could find out more about her because I'm from, from uh, Newark Presbytery. There was Eliza Everett uh, from Painesville, Ohio. Her father was a lawyer, likely a churchman. And, and Eliza was a protege of uh, Marilia Houghton, who came out of uh, Mount Holyoke uh, College, uh, really a female seminary in those days. And she was a protege in turn of Mary Lyons who set up Mount Holyoke. Uh, so she took the Mary Lyons version of education uh, to, to Beirut. Uh, there was Frances Irwin from Minneapolis, uh, one of three girls, uh, her father was a, a lawyer and a federal prosecutor in Minneapolis, also a very uh, well uh, a national churchman. Uh, she went to the University of Minnesota, had a BA and an MA from Minnesota. Uh, and her colleague uh, setting up the first college was Winifred Shannon from Iola, Kansas. Her father, she, Winifred grew up in this marvelous hardware store that, <laughs> that figures into the story. And she went to public schools there uh, and the University of Kansas. And she went on, uh, she became, uh, she majored in French and uh, was Phi Beta Kappa, uh, later got an MA. So they were the first two real college educated missionaries to go over. There were two two teachers who were born in, uh, in Beirut. They were the daughters of missionaries and they, they, they figure prominently in the story. But what, one thing I wanna point out is the average age of these uh, women when they got to, Be arrived in Beirut was, uh, I figured it out 27 and a half. And it's that high because uh, a couple of them were older and Sarah was the oldest at 32. So most of them were in their mid or early 20s. And, and sadly, some of them died in Syria. Um, and the average age at death of those who died was, was 23. So it was a very risky thing to go over there at that in those, in those times. Well, it, I mean, it, as you point out, they must have had an extraordinary sense of call to take this journey um, in that time. And um, one of the things that, uh, you know, informed their experience as educators was what they had done before sailing um, to the Mideast. And one thing that we know from your book that uh, gave Sarah Smith a lot of experience was she established a school 
for Mohegan Indians in Connecticut before she went overseas. So can you speak a little bit about how that might have influenced her time, uh, prepared her as an educator or not prepared her as the case may be? Well, as, as I hinted here, Sarah was an educated person, woman for her time, but she had very little education, formal education. She, she was an avid reader, obviously, and she may have been, I suspect she was tutored somehow given her the, the, her high class upbringing. But uh, she, um, it, her brothers went to Yale. <laughs> so there was no question they were getting an education. But uh, that was not an option for her. And she wanted desperately for her younger brother, Peter, to become ordained and go into the ministry. But unfortunately, he died early too, right out of college. Uh, and that's when she committed herself to pick up his mantle. But she couldn't become a, she couldn't become an ordained minister because men were not, or women were not ordained. So she said, well, oh, she figured, okay, I'll become a missionary. And her first, um, first idea was to become a missionary and go west of the Mississippi and minister to American, Native Americans. But then she thought, well, wait a minute, I've, the Mohegans, there's some Mohegans right here in the woods outside of Norwich. So she, she goes out in the woods and she's walking through the woods about seven miles and she's following the sound of the axes. She can hear them chopping with axes. And she discovers this remnant of about a hundred Mohegans left. It's all that's left of the tribe because they've been decimated by disease and poverty. And so she says, well, to herself, I've got to organize some my colleagues, some girlfriends in town. We'll, uh, we'll set up uh, a Sunday school. So she and a friend organize a Sunday school in the home of one of the, the women in the tribe. And then they raise some money and they build a meeting house. And so they move a Sunday school into the meeting house and then they have weekday classes where Sarah teaches not only the children and young people, but a few adult Mohegans as well, men and women, males and females. And that little school grows and she gets money from her cousin who's a, a congressman um, and they, they finished the school, build a very nice school that has become, uh, that became the, the Mohegan church. And you can still go there. There's a picture of it in the book. It is the Mohegan congregational church, uh, that's been, uh, restored beautifully by the tribe. And it's a very sacred place for the tribe now. And you can, uh, but, but she, she got going. So that's where she learned how to, set up a school and how to teach. She had no formal training. She just learned it by, by rote. And, but then she met Eli. So he was on furlough and he needed a helpmate to go back to Beirut because they required that the missionaries from that point on be married. They were no longer sending bachelors over. It was too dangerous so for various reasons, which was spelled out in the book. But uh, he, he said, he, he proposed to her and said, I want you to come and help me run the press, the mission press in Beirut. And she felt called and she, so then she enlisted a, a, a friend of hers, Rebecca Williams from nearby Lebanon, Connecticut, ironically, uh, to take over the school. And then Sarah was married in July of 1833 to Eli and they left for Boston. So the answer is, is yes, she, she had the experience of starting a school and teaching. So she was quite confident that she could repeat this when she got to Beirut to do it again. The only, the only hurdle was she had to learn Arabic because she had to teach the girls in Arabic, at least start them teaching in Arabic as she slowly taught them English. So it was a back and forth. Uh, so, uh, and, and then she asked, Aaron, she asked Rebecca to come with her uh, to Beirut, and, and Rebecca did come over and teach with her. And then I'll, I'll let you uh, read the rest of the story from that point on. Good. Well, one of the things you, uh, you touched on earlier was 
this um, extraordinary document you found online when you're doing your, after you've done the research for the 75th anniversary of LAU, the memoir of Sarah L. Huntington Smith, late of the American mission in Syria, which it sounds like that really opened some doors for you and, um, and really helped out with your, with your research. Um, you know, that, as I understand it, that's an extraordinary document in its own right. Uh, it's put together posthumously by Sarah's brother. Is that correct? Well, actually, her brother-in-law. Her brother-in-law. Her, her older sister's uh, husband, who was I, also an ordained minister. And I think you might have said in a blog post that you wrote for us that that was a kind of bestseller in its time, that that, was, that, that memoir was something that, um, you know, had a, uh, got a lot of attention. So um, could you speak a little bit more about that memoir and just what it is, you know, what, what that was like for you to find that online and you end up coming to PHS, which we'll, get to, which we'll get to in a little bit, and looking into the collections here in particular. But how did that document sort of, you know, further your path as a researcher? Well, it it blew my mind because it was a gold mine. It was it was not only the story of her school, it was her whole biography. Because what uh, Edward Hooker, her brother-in-law, did was take all the letters. Uh, as, as we're hitting at, Sarah did not return to the United States, and you'll have to read that story in the book. But he took all her letters that she had sent home, and he arranged, arranged them in chronological order. And then he filled in the ga gaps. He gave her pedigree and her upbringing and her, her conversion experience and, uh, and, the, and her uh, experience with this Mohegan school, and then her letters fill in the Beirut story. And then she, he got Eli, some of Eli's letters, and Eli fills in the end of the story. And so he put it all together into this whole biography of Sarah. Uh, it was, uh, it was, he, I guess he, paid to have it published in Boston first. It went through one edition, there was a second edition, and then the American Tract Society picked it up and published it. So it, uh, the 1845 edition is prob probably was a bestseller because uh, church people, men and women, loved to work, to read about the missionaries because they were the worldwide correspondents at the time. That's how they found out about the rest of the world getting firsthand accounts coming back from the missionaries. And you can, you can still find some original copies online. Um, sometimes, you know, it was 30, 40, $50 maybe. Uh, used books uh, available, historic books. But there are also paperback uh, editions, reprints that are available, readily available for much less money. So if you want to read her actual memoir, it's readily available. And, it, and it's also in a, a digitized version online. You can read the whole thing online if you want, which I did originally. Have you supplied any, you know, a number of those volumes or, you know, versions to LAU? Have you taken those, uh, any of those on your trips to Beirut? It's funny you asked to, when I went over to give the lecture uh, back in uh, 2009, I presented the university with a, a copy of the 1845 version for for them to have and they were quite pleased to have it wonderful oh and also let me do that's an interesting you, you just triggered an interesting thought but um what i did when i found things at the historical society that i wanted to uh reference later for writing i would ask uh, the staff there uh, Lisa Jacobson and, and her assistants, if they would please make copies, and they did. So I would I would uh, take uh, pay for copies and take them back, and I'd have them at home to to work with. But then I put those all together chronologically with the with the help of of my uh, research assistant Christine Linder, whom you know well at the at the Historical Society, um, and we we put them in chronological folders, and I gave all of those to the university. So they are going to have in their archives photocopies of the things that are, from which I 
or wrote the book, the, the, the primary resource resources. Terrific. Um, one of the things you write about in your book, uh, Bob, is how Sarah Smith revolutionized female education in the Mideast. And I, I think it might make sense for us to take a little bit of time to hear from you some of the ways that she did that and some of the ways that other pioneering educators revolutionized education um, that okay. you mention in your book. Okay, well, this, up to that time, the, the schools for, for girls in uh, Syria, Ottoman Syria, we're talking about. This is before, long before the creation of modern Lebanon, which didn't come about until uh, the 1920s. So up until that time, Lebanon was a part of Syria. But uh, the early schools for the girls could attend were almost always religious schools and convents uh, or in, and I'm not even sure if they, maybe some of the girls could go to the madrasas in the, in the, in the uh, mosque, but it was very ad hoc and uh, scattered and, and, and not, not, not quality education. So it was, the, uh, it was the missionaries who really first organized schools and, um, and they modeled them after American schools and they offered a basic education, uh, what I call the four R's, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic and religion. So uh, that became the, the model that uh, was then duplicated. And they trained, the, the whole idea was, first of all, to convert the girls to become Protestants. And then to have them become teachers so they in turns would teach other girls and uh, it would go on and then they actually uh, the the better students were asked to stay on as assistant teachers and or become or sent out to other mission schools throughout Syria Ottoman Syria or even Egypt uh, to become teachers in missionary schools for girls so that uh, that really started the whole process, but that started with uh, they started with elementary schools, but then they go on with uh, Eliza Everett and her colleagues, uh, the secondary education, and then when you get to in the book you get to uh, uh, Francis Irwin and Winifred Shannon, they started the first American Junior College for Women. So that was the first higher education, the first college for women in, in the Arab world. Um, we know one of the things that is um, pointed out in your book, it, it's readily uh, uh, immediately available um, to people is that this spans a certain time span that you're focus on, focusing on. And you've chosen as your time span, 1834 up until 1937 which there's a great deal that happens in your book between 1834 and 1937. But one good way for people to maybe get um, a little sense of the scope of your book is to understand why is that the end date that you've chosen, 1937? Why does that feel like a good um, kind of bookend for the experience that you're focusing on here? Well, uh, they wanted me to connect the dots from Sarah to the present university. Well, that was 100 and, 190 years. And as I got into it, I'm thinking, this is gonna be a lot of work. So after a while, I realized it was just too much to try to get into one book. And I thought, well, the first century is, is enough for one book. So what, what I was actually able to do was take it from the, even before Sarah's arrival, the, the pre, prelude, so to speak, uh, before she arrived, and then all of her experience and up through uh, elementary and then secondary education and up to the first college, which took it to higher education for women. So that in itself 
was a was a nice unit by itself. And I just have to leave the other uh, the rest of the history to someone else. And I'm happy to say that someone did pick that up. And there is a university. They, the university has has published a companion volume that uh, takes it from where I left off. But another milestone there is and I had taken it through the story through 83 straight years of female leadership. And when I end the story, the principal of the college is a male, uh, William Stoltzfus, and he takes on the leadership of the college. So I'm really focusing on the female era. And you've, as you pointed out, you've done a lot of research um, at PHS um, to, to um, gain access to the information uh, of these missionaries, of the schools. Um, you talked about Christine Lindner, and um, there's a blog that Christine, Kristen yeah. Gate has put into the chat that people can access. That's a really terrific um, look at the work that she's done here. Um, can you um, talk a little bit about you know, one or two collections at PHS that were especially helpful to the research that you've done? Well, the, the main collection was the Syria, Lebanon mission collection uh, that provided uh, a huge amount of primary source material. Uh, that included uh, the, actually the, the, the first missionaries up to 1870 uh, were congreg primarily congregationalists or at least missionaries of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Education, which was a predominantly congregational organization, mission agency, although Presbyterians were very much involved. But uh, the, the, those records are primarily at the Houghton Library at Harvard. But fortunately, I found those, a lot of those records on microfiche at uh, the Historical Society in Philadelphia. So I didn't have to go all the way to Boston to get those. And then in the collection were uh, annual school reports, uh, miscellaneous reports, school records, um, school correspondence, uh, mission correspondence having to do with the school. There were, uh, then I could tap into the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Mission Records, and then um, personal correspondence, even diary entries of the missionaries themselves. Um, and, and another source were mission uh, publications. And one, one thing I really loved was getting into um, the photographs and the illustrations and the maps that I found in the uh, Historical Society. And then, of course, they, they have the full collection of the church uh, women's uh, journals. And the missionaries would write articles that would be published in those journals. So some of the pieces, especially later on in the book, some of the, the, the units I could find to tell the story were actually lifted from those articles that were written by the missionaries to tell the women, church women back home what they were doing at that, at that point of time, especially interesting during the World War II and, and the horrible, the famines and the isolation of that period. Very interesting articles. Yeah, um, I wondered, I wondered uh, Bob, if you had been accessing um, some of those journals and photographs in order to inform the writing you did. It's, it's very scenic in a lot of places. And I mean, as you're, you're the reading you gave opening up, you do a nice job of showing us these places. And uh, I wondered if those were materials that were helpful in a way that maybe some people don't expect an archive to have to really help you get a, get a sense of the place, the, the look of it, um, other things that are really bring the place alive even at a distance of 150, oh. 170 years. Oh, I, you know, there, are, there are hundreds of examples in the book. Uh, I think right off the top, the first automobile that arrived in Beirut was quite a stir. Uh, and, and one of the missionaries, missionary in Sidon could, could get from, from uh, Tripoli, could get to uh, Beirut in record time, which was hours, um, by automobile. Uh, so that was kind of fun. The missionaries, one of the missionaries uh, gets all excited about the trains, the new, the new uh, train line 
that goes from Beirut to Damascus. So he takes a ride on the train and describes it and going up up the uh, up Mount Lebanon, up the side of the mountain, and describing the view. Uh, they're just marvelous uh, anecdotal things that I was able to find and just fill in along with the historical documents, uh, the, the uh, outside histories of Lebanon and Syria, Lebanon and Beirut, fill those in. So it, it, it just all came together very beautifully. And uh, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of interesting history and um, insights into the time and the era and the place that uh, are in the book. Well, one of the things um, that we recognize as an archives is oftentimes the materials we have tell a story from a certain perspective. And you have spoken about how you've done a lot of research here. The historical record that we have here and that's available to people in this country often comes from a white missionary perspective. And so how do you and other historians compensate for you know, the, having a thinner historical record that um, shows um, native perspectives on, on these matters? Well, first of all, you have to admit your, and state your own limitations. Um, I'm an American, I'm using American records, writing about American missionaries. So that's one perspective. Uh, but I'm, I'm not a native uh, Lebanese or Syrian. I don't speak Arabic. I don't know the culture. So it's, it's obviously I'm not the one to provide that perspective. So I state that in the book, although I do make some comments at the end about um, the different, the way the missionaries uh, actually looked uh, upon their, their students and the, and the populace, the native people, uh, and, and, and how they saw a distinction between themselves as the haves and them as the have-nots and so forth. But I, I have to leave it to, uh, to native uh, scholars, to uh, Lebanese, Syrian, uh, Arab scholars, to, to analyze that. But I would hope at some time that the women, the students of LAU, the female students would get curious about that and they speaking the language, knowing the culture and learning how to do research would dig back and trace some of those early uh, teachers and assistant teachers and tell their stories because those, that's a whole other uh, half, at least, of the story that needs to be told and, and uncovered. So I would hope this would inspire them to say, hey, what about the Native teachers? What about our sisters and grandmothers and great-grandmothers that uh, gave us, participated in giving this, lecture, this uh, legacy to us? I would, I would love to see that happen. But I will say, that I do uh, spend a whole chapter on one native teacher in the middle of the book, uh, Miss Rufka Gregory. She was, a, she was uh, really a, kind of adopted by the missionaries. She was an orphan at the age of two by, um, by Matilda Whiting and taken to, uh, taken to Jerusalem. But then she is brought up uh, and becomes a teacher herself and there are two civil wars in the middle of the book. The first one is the civil war between the Druze and the Christians, 1860 civil war in, on Mount Lebanon. And that's when the schools had to close down and the American teachers had to leave. It was unsafe for them. So uh, in order to, but, but a couple of the missionaries, the male missionaries, wanted to get the school going again. So they recruited Rufka Gregory, who had been an assistant teacher and had taught at the elementary level. They brought her in and said, we'd like you to pick up the ball here. And she did. And she started what became the real Beirut female seminary as an all-native school for several years while there was an absence of American teachers because on top of the civil war in Lebanon, there was a civil war in the United States. So missionaries, women were not going back. 
during our American Civil War. So that five year period there where Rifka Gregory picked up the ball, got the secondary uh, girls school going, did a marvelous job. And uh, she really was a, a prime example of a native teacher who uh, became an excellent, uh, not only teacher, but principal of the school. And there's one little other episode that uh, relates to this. Uh, just before the First World War, some Muslim women came to the teachers at the time and said, we'd like to start a school like this for our girls so they can be trained as teachers and go on and teach other Muslim girls. And the missionaries were thrilled by this. And they, that's, boy, that, that really is, a, is their dream of how to spread education for, for girls and women. And so they said, fine. So they took some of the Muslim girls into school, tuition free, so they could get the education there. Then the First World War comes along, famine, war, just horrible things happening, as you read in the chapter called Surrounded by Suffering. Uh, and then the, uh, but then the women came back after the war was over. And they said, okay, we want to pick up where we left off. And so the missionaries help them and, the, and they go off and they start a Muslim school for girls. Uh, and that, that started a whole tradition of Muslim schools. Amazing. Um, I think we're to the time where uh, it might make sense to bring in a couple questions from our audience. So um, if I may, I'll go ahead and uh, bring Kristen in so she can uh, pass those on. Sure, our first question is a two-part question. Um, the first part of the question is, to what extent did the aspirations of the Second Great Awakening regarding female engagement in education affect Sarah Smith's educational philosophy? <laughs> Boy, you need to ask an expert on that one. Um, related to her, it's, I would just start by saying, she was a product of the Second Great Awakening herself. Uh, there were, uh, it was a time of great ferment in New England and Connecticut, especially of, uh, of meetings, uh, evan evangelistic meetings, uh, new churches springing up, revivals being held. And so she, she was indoctrinated in this and wanted when she had her own conversion to further it and take it to, to Lebanon. As to, I, I'm not sure I, I'm expert enough to relate it to, to education. And, and I think I'd honestly have to leave that to, to others. Um, yeah, I think I, I need to leave it at that and not, not get into trouble. <laughs> That's, that's always wise. <laughs> uh, great, Kristen, you wanna go ahead and uh, pass on the second one? So, yeah, the second part of that question, um, it, it was just somebody was wondering if you were related to David Stoddard, the pioneering ABCFM missionary to Persia, uh, who in 1840s formalized the grammatical rules of modern Syriac language. I suspect if you traced it, traced our roots back, they would cross someplace because the Stoddards arrived in Connecticut in the first Stoddards in, in 1638. And uh, they went through up through Connecticut into uh, Massachusetts. So Worcester, Massachusetts, is, there were a lot of Stoddards in there, uh, Stoddard Foundation and so forth. Um, but I've heard of him. Uh, and I, I came, I've come across his name in, in my research, but uh, I don't know much about him, but I'm glad to hear about him. Proud to hear about him. Uh, Barbara Werner was wondering um, about, I think you may maybe mentioned early deaths. Um, and she was wondering what may have caused early deaths during uh, Sarah's time, if it was from infections or childbirth or unrest in the mission field. Well, um, I know Barbara, and I know that she's uh, an infectious disease expert, and uh, uh, that's why she's uh, how she's asked the question, the, the uh, what's behind her question. But the answer is yes. I mean, if you look in the index 
uh, that in the back of the book, you'll see all the diseases are listed, uh, dysentery, uh, the, black, the, the black plague, um, uh, typhoid. Um, I'm having a hard time thinking of that, but uh, uh, what's, uh, they'll come to me. But anyway, the answer is yes, they're all there. And of course, the medical attention available to them um, improved over time. So the ones who who died, and and did I mention the average age of the of the of their average age at death was 23. Did I say that? I, I think I may have. Uh, but um, you could see there was a break about 1850 when the health improves. And I'm not sure, I think that's because there was better medical uh, attention uh, available to them. And of course, it improves radically uh, uh, over uh, the last half of the 19th century. Uh, we have a question from Lisa. She was wondering, um, while you were conducting your, conducting your research, what information did you come across that was unexpected or surprising? Oh, golly. Uh, there were there were always little surprises. Rob, well, when I found uh, Francis Irwin's letters, she, uh, they're all in. Francis Irwin was a historian. And so when she got home, and she went on to teach at McAllister College as an assistant professor of history after she returned home from the field. But uh, she took all, gathered all her letters home and again, put them in chronological order and gave them to the historical society. And lo and behold, I opened a file and there were the, her letters in her handwriting week by week by week. Every Sunday evening, she'd write a letter home telling what happened the week. And that's where I got some of the greatest material where she actually shared, she leveled with her parents how discouraged she was and she was ready to come home and these male missionaries are just a pain in the kazoo, you know. <laughs> they, they, she really leveled with it. But, uh, but then in her actual work, her spirits pick up and she, she carries on. But you get a real human insight to, uh, to uh, and some of, the, some of the pictures, the photographs, she and her friends took snapshots, black and white snapshots. So those were delightful, uh, were wonderful to find, and they illustrate uh, a good part of the book. There are lots of lots of little uh, finds like that that really they were aha moments. Thank you. That that sounds like a great kind of you're able to illustrate um, her life in a way that you know yeah. archives could provide insight. Um, our next question is from a PHS board member, George Abdo. Um, he was wondering if any of their, if any of the descendants of um, Francis or the other missionaries mentioned in your book were still around, and if so, if you've had any contact with them. I, you've put your finger on what I'm doing right now, and that is I'm making contact with the home churches of the missionaries as they exist today. The so I'm starting with the ministers, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I've traced back, I'm, of course, Sarah, I know, came from Norwich, and uh, the second congregational church where she was a member no longer exists, but uh, the Park Congregational Church in Norwich was her brother's church, and there's a memorial window to her, and that's where I found her portrait, which is hanging on the wall in the, in the parlor, in the church hall. So that's what's on the, that's the portraits uh, that's uh, here on the front of the, of the book. So uh, then, um, and um, I just made contact this week, actually, actually, with the pastor of the First Church Congregational, Painesville, where Eliza Everett was, I'm sure, a member, and her family was members. And he was all excited to learn, hey, you know, I've, I've written about this missionary and I think she came from your congregation. 
So we're, we're already to, oh, talking about my making a visit there and giving a talk, and they, they want to have more. In Iola, Kansas, I've contacted the missionary, and it's definite that that's the church of Winifred Shannon. And, and the newspaper editor there uh, remembers her brother who ran, took over the hardware store. And now uh, I'm in touch with them and, and the librarian there, and they're talking about asking me to come and have a visit, which I would love to do, and, and nose around and see where they came from. Uh, I'm still looking for Francis Irwin's home church. I thought it was Westminster in Minneapolis, but uh, we checked it out, and, and it has, we have not found their, that Irwin family in that church. So I'm now asking folks in St. Paul at Central Church, maybe they were members there. So uh, I think you know, maybe if, maybe we can go through church records at the historical site, session records, and, and find out where these uh, families uh, came from. But this is, this is a whole new chapter uh, in this, this uh, adventure that I'm on with uh, Sarah and her sisters. Could you just mention um, again where the painting on the cover of the book is located? It is a, um, it's a portrait that Sarah had printed, a pub, uh, she went to New York and hired a, uh, a, a very famous artist at the time to, to uh, paint her portrait so she could give it to her father as she as she left, this was her, really her wedding portrait. So she could give it to her father so he could remember her as she went off to Lebanon because she feared she may never return and he may never see her again. And actually that's what happened. And right across from it is the Mohegan, the Mohegan church, which is, uh, the Mohegan Congregational Church, was, which was actually the building that she built as her meeting house and school. And this is the mannequin of a Mohegan uh, medicine woman. And that belt on that mannequin was uh, the belt owned by the medicine woman in Sarah's time. So Sarah would have seen that belt. And then down below here is the Mohegan, the, the Mohegan Sun Casino. <laughs> Because Sarah's, um, Sarah saved the Mohegan tribe from being moved west of the Mississippi because they, she made them, she converted some, they became Christians, and she educated, educated some. So they were civilized and educated, and therefore they could not be moved according to Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act. So she literally saved the tribe and saved their reservation so that when it became possible for them to set up a casino, they set it up on that reservation and they owe their existence on their tribal land to Sarah Huntington. And if you go to that casino, you'll see a plaque in the casino for acknowledging that in their indebtedness to Sarah Huntington. It uh, looks like we have one more question in the Q and A. Um, the question is is asking if Sarah was a part of a missionary community or a specific congregation or church in Beirut. Oh yes, yes, they had their own congregation. First of all, there was the expatriate uh, uh, community of English speaking people, Americans and British. So there was that group, but that within that there was the missionary community and they would get together once a month. Uh, they take a day off, get together and worship together and have their meeting together. But the decisions of the mission were always made by the men, the women. Uh, Sarah was, was thrilled later on uh, in her time there because she and the other women were invited to sit in and listen to the men decide, <laughs> decide the uh, business of the meeting, of the mission. 
but it's a very important uh, mission. And, and initially, the, uh, the English-speaking community wanted Sarah to set up a school for their kids, for the expat kids. But she said, no, I'm going to teach the native girls and learn Arabic. Well, uh, we are just about at six o'clock. And Bob, I, that sounds like a really nice way, a uh, nice story to end um, this session on. I mean, what a, what, a, what a right choice for her to make and what a brave choice in that time to make. And we're, we're so glad that you've um, brought Sarah's story um, to all of us through your book. Earlier in the chat, um, or earlier in the session, Kristen has pasted into the chat information on where you can find Bob's book, and we would encourage you to do so. Um, there's also information about the book that can be found on the PHS website. We have a page where we like to highlight um, recent uh, publications that have been done by PHS researchers, and that's something where you can find out more about this publication and others. So uh, we would encourage you to check that out. Thanks, Fred. If I could just have a parting word here, um, two things. Number one, I, I, if you could put my uh, email address in the chat for anyone who wanted to follow up with questions or, or get in touch with me, I, I really, you know, I'd love to have any feedback uh, you you want to you might offer after reading the book. Uh, but secondly, let me just say that uh, originally uh, we had an offer by uh, Westminster John Knox Press to publish this book in the United States. And I desperately wanted to do that, but uh, it, was, it was too expensive because this was gonna have a very limited audience and we had to find the supplemental funds. And so the, the university which underwrote the publication said it was, Dr. Jabba said, it's, it's gonna be cheaper to publish this in Beirut. And that's a whole nother story that we didn't get into today. Of, of the difficulty of doing that under the conditions in the Beirut now. But um, the, the challenge now is there's, there's no way here, mechanism here uh, established by a publishing house to promote the book. So it's really up to me to promote it through um, book talks like this. So any help <laughs> you uh, folks out there can give and readers uh, can give uh, would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, spread the word if you like the book, tell others. Uh, if you uh, are of a mind to uh, set up a local book club and uh, get in touch with me and, and we could do something on Zoom, I'd be happy to, happy to do that. So any way we can get the word out uh, would be appreciated. Thanks. Terrific. And I, I made a note, Bob, earlier about Francis Irwin, your question for looking for maybe help if people know where you know uh the congregation yeah. it was her home church so um kristen uh is uh works with uh sonia at um sonia prescott at phs on our uh, social media and that might be a good question for us to ask as a follow-up to see if anybody knows about francis Irwin's home church um so we will we will do that and we will uh, continue to encourage people to check out this this wonderful uh history um, we want to take a little bit of time at the end of uh, this session to also just express our thanks, our gratitude to the many donors and supporters of PHS who make programs like PHS Live possible. Um, if you would like to make a gift of support to PHS, you can go ahead and visit um, www.history.pcusa.org forward slash give. And I'm going to put Kristen on the spot. Oh, look, she's already got it in the chat. If you want to go find out more about how to do that, you can uh, check out um, our gift page there. Um, so thank, thanks to Bob uh, foremost for being here. Um, really appreciate you uh, being on this session, Bob. Can't wait for this um, pandemic to be um, far enough down the line that we can see you back um, in the Historical Society and also um, see all of you out there who, who have joined us tonight um, back in Philadelphia. So um, good night for, uh, for now. And uh, thank you again for being here with us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.